and then we can move to the next paper. And the presenter is Nikolaos Atavanis from Louisiana State University. Welcome. And the paper is on cross subsidization of back credit in a lending crisis. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for including the paper in the program. This is joint work with uh, my good friends and colleagues, uh, Brian Lee, Stefan, uh, Stavros Panagias, and Margarita Tsutsura. So we know in financial crisis, uh, financial crisis impair both sides of a credit relationship. Borrowers find it harder to repay their loans, and lenders are exposed to increasing NPLs. Uh, in these times of the greater moil, a common feature is lenders uh, they're tempted to extend preferential lending at lending at preferential terms and sometimes uh, upcharge uh, their stronger borrowers in order to make like some of the losses we have some episodes recently where we observed this like the european sovereign crisis and more recently the COVID pandemic and in order to motivate uh, the topic uh, i would like to share um, a, <clears throat> a graph from uh, facharia in all 2019 that shows that uh, the share of zombie firms in Europe increased significantly after 2011. Uh, the literature is focused on the effects of on concerns of misallocation of credit, uh, but also an important question is like whether there is uh, any rationale behind this behavior, be behind these practices of like subsidizing and charging during a crisis, uh, or it's like just an outcome of personal bank relationships. Also, it's very important to uh, find out like who's paying for it. it. Like the cost comes out of the bank profit, so it's like the shareholders and potentially the taxpayers in the case of a, a bailout, or the cost is moved to the stronger borrowers, creating a setting of cross subsidization. It is true that we have very limited micro level studies on subsidization and cross subsidization because it's very challenging to precisely identify the subsidies, what we call here the negative markups. And the past literature has relied on indirect imputation methods in order to identify which uh, loans have been subsidized, but this uh, makes the methodology subject uh, to the joint hypothesis problem. In other words, the main uh, question is tested along with the validity of the identification criterion. And here you can see an uh, incomplete list of uh, criteria that they have been used in the past in order to find subsidized loans. Now, if you try to identify the positive markups, uh, which loans are being upcharged, this is a more, even more like challenging uh, task because many of these criteria that you see on the slide, they don't apply because they're focused on distress. So here in this paper, we develop a theoretical model that predicts cross subsidization in bank to firm lending during a crisis based on two conditions collapsing collateral values, and limited access to capital that impairs bank competition. Uh, we will exploit a regulatory reform that required Greek banks to estimate the marginal cost at the loan level, what we call the break-even rate, the rate that, if charged, uh, makes the lender break-even, including like uh, funding, operation, uh, operational uh, costs, uh, expected and unexpected losses. And this gives us the opportunity to directly identify ex ante markups, negative and positive, as the differences between the actual rate of the loan minus the break-even rate of the loan. Uh, the main empirical results I'm going to show you is uh, cross subsidization from safer to riskier uh, firms and asymmetric pass-through in the intensive margin. Uh, to our best knowledge, this is the first paper that documents cross subsidization uh, between borrowers and corporate loans, and we find that these subsidies are like really significant. It is important to note that uh, our notion of cross subsidization is not the result of asymmetric information or pooling. Here we have borrowers with observable differences, and the bank knowingly and willingly, for reasons that will become apparent. Uh, uh, chooses to extend negative and positive markups. Uh, since we directly observe positive and negative markups, rather than inferring the subsidies, we can speak a little bit about the joint hypothesis problem, which is like uh, the biggest like uh, 
uh, challenge of the Zobel uh, lending literature. Uh, if we have time, we can talk about the efficacy of financial regulation and its limits. And of course, we're set like in Greece uh, during the crisis. So our work is also related uh, to the work on impaired financial intermediation during the European sovereign crisis. Let's have a, an overview of the model. We have like two states. This is a two period model. We have a crisis period and a non-crisis period and two types of firms, the safe ones and the risky ones with high profitability, high payoff, uh, high cash flow and low profitability, low payoff, low cash flow. We have a competitive market, no asymmetric information. Uh, the economy starts uh, in a crisis period at uh, t equals zero and then escapes to a non-crisis um, uh, state at some exponentially distributed time tau. Uh, each firm borrows one unit of uh, capital and produces a stochastic cash flow uh, pi that depends on the type. And uh, the bank ob obtains RJ per unit of time and can liquidate the project anytime. Upon liquidation, the bank receives the value of the collateral in its state. What differentiates the crisis uh, and the non-crisis state is that during the crisis, collateral values are significantly depressed. And also during the crisis, banks have limited access to capital. This means that they must liquidate their existing projects to finance new ones. So let me show you the results uh, of uh, the equilibrium results here in the two states. I'm going to start with the non-crisis state. In the non-crisis state, the risky firm is efficiently liquidated because the value of the loan is less than the value of the collateral. Uh, at the same time, the bank will charge uh, the safe firm um, <clears throat> an interest rate that will just account for the funding cost and the credit risk because we have like a uh, perfect competition here. The value of the loan, as you can see, uh, cannot exceed the face value, which is equal to one. Uh, if for some reason the bank decides to charge like a higher interest rate, this will motivate a competitor to step in and forge the loan. Things are quite different in the crisis state. Uh, what we find is like uh, for the risky firm, liquidation becomes inefficient due to depressed collateral values. As you can see here, the value of the loan is greater than the depressed value of the collateral. Uh, so uh, the risky firm escapes liquidation because the bank recognizes the option value of keeping uh, the risky firm alive until either uh, its profitability or uh, the economy rebounds. At the same time, the bank will extract the maximum it can from the risky firm, so it will collect the entire cash flow. And for the safe firm, the, the bank will extract the rents by charging a markup. We'll apply what we call like limit pricing. Uh, the key to understand how this works is like if banks have like limited access uh, to capital, they have to liquidate some of their existing uh, projects to poach loans uh, from competitors. Since the collateral values are very low, it gets like very expensive to engage in this process and liquidate uh, your uh, existing projects in order uh, <coughs> to poach uh, loans from competitors. Uh, the cost here in this model of doing this uh, is D over C, where D is the minimum value of the existing loans of the competitor. Uh, this gives an opportunity uh, to our bank to upcharge the safe uh, firms up to the point, up to D over C, uh, <clears throat> that uh, the competitor is indifferent between uh, poaching and not poaching the loan. So in this uh, special case that we have like impaired competition, the value of the loan of the safe firm can actually be higher than the face value of the loan because it's very difficult for the competitor uh, to step in. So the, the pre uh, predictions of the model under the crisis state, the difference between the interest rates charged uh, to the risk in the safe firm is smaller than the increase in the expected loss upon default. This means that we should uh, see like limited cross-section of the pass-through. Uh, so the interest rate for the risky firm is lower than it should. The risk, the interest rate for the safe firm is like uh, higher and this creates this inequality. Um, 
When the crisis becomes more severe, we expect this cross-sectional pasture to decline, or in other words, uh, cross-subsidization to be more pronounced. Think about it when we have like a more severe crisis, this gives like, makes the liquidation debt weight cost higher. So it gives our bank like uh, the opportunity to upcharge more, the safe uh, um, firms, and also uh, the, uh, the subsidies are gonna be larger due to the fall in the collateral values and uh, the cash flows uh, by else. Finally, uh, for the uh, risky firm, the interest rate, uh, the actual interest rate is disconnected from the riskiness of the loan. Remember, like we found like in the crisis stage, that the bank just captures the entire cash flow and depends on the borrower's ability to pay. This means that we should expect to find like a symmetric pass-through in the intensive margin. Now, our setting is in the Greek financial, during uh, the Greek financial crisis. I don't have to spend a lot of time here to uh, tell you like uh, how intense and long it was. Like I'm pretty sure that everybody's familiar uh, <clears throat> with the effects of like uh, to the, uh, on the Greek economy and the Greek banking sector. For the purposes of this paper, like this setting satisfies the two conditions we need for the model to work. We have collapsing collateral values and we have limited access to capital since essentially the entire country was excluded from financial markets for many, many years. Uh, our data include the large corporate loan portfolio from a large systemic Greek bank that was recently capitalized. Uh, and uh, we focus on term loans and credit lines because these products tend to renew like more frequently so we can observe the same borrower several times in our sample. Uh, we have uh, a very rich data set uh, uh, many variables. The key variable here is the break-even rate that I'm going to give you more details in the next slide. But also we have like the actual rate of each loan, balances, maturities, etc. In total, we have like uh, <coughs> over 1,600 uh, loans made to 150 uh, large Greek companies. Now I'm going to skip the summary statistics. I just want to show you that uh, the markups that we find, even like in this table, are quite significant on both extremes. Uh, and we're gonna see this also in a graph. And talk a little bit about the regulatory change that happened like in the beginning of 2015. Following the bank uh, recapitalizations, mainly from, uh, with public funds, monitoring trustees uh, required uniform pricing models for, for credit products. This mandate reflected concerns of pre preferential lending pra uh, practices not only in Greece, but in other countries also of the European South. Responding to these mandates, each systemic uh, bank could create its own model adhering to two requirements. Use exogenous risk assessments to avoid mo uh, model manipulation. And once approved, the model should be uniformly applied to all loans of the same class. In our case, uh, the large corporate portfolio. The product of this model was the break-even rate, which is directly the marginal cost of the loan. The break-even rate has a fixed component that reflects uh, funding and operating costs, and a variable component that depends on customer and loan characteristics. Since most of the, uh, most of the loans that we have in the sample are of short maturity and uh, floating rate, the cross-sectional variation of the break-even rate comes mainly from the credit risk cost. Now the managers could freely extend credit above the break-even rate of the loan, but they had to obtain internal approval, uh, go through a screening process and uh, um, state the reason for loans where the actual rate was below the break-even rate. So let's see how cross-subsidization looks in a graph. Here we have like all the loans in our sample in the uh, horizontal axis, we have the break-even rate uh, at the loan level, and on the vertical axis, we have uh, the actual rates. So you will notice that most safe firms uh, that have like low break-even rates, they tend to be uh, above the 45 degree line, meaning that they are upsides, they get an actual rate uh, that is higher than the break-even rate, and the reverse pattern for risky firms, we have like firms that they should, uh, they were supposed to um, <coughs> go 
total with 20 and 25 percent, and instead they receive credit at like 5 and 10 percent. Now, <clears throat> to, this, to see this like pattern more formally, uh, we run the regression of the actual rates on the break even rates, and we find across specifications evidence of limited cross sectional pass through. Uh, more specifically, 1 percent change in break even rate results in like 30 basis points in actual rates. This uh, seems to be unaffected by firm and loan characteristics. Uh, also, interestingly, once we augment the specification with firm fixed effects, uh, we find significant uh, pass-through in this specification. Now, our sample period also includes uh, the uh, May-June 2015 period where uh, the Greek crisis reached its peak with the referendum the capital controls, and we can see the pass-through coefficient, how it evolves from the beginning of uh, the introduction of the pricing model, uh, and then we see that uh, the pass-through coefficient drops essentially to zero uh, as uh, the, the crisis becomes more severe in the period of May and June 2015. Once the Greek government changed its stance uh, and signed the third referendum, the third uh, uh, memorandum in, uh, on July 13th, the coefficient uh, jumps up again and uh, reaches like the level of 0 0.5 for the rest of the year. So, uh, in order to see uh, the pass-through in the intensive margin, we separate the borrowers into two groups, the relative um, safer uh, companies with uh, below median break-even rate and the relatively riskier ones with above median break-even rate. And we run our regression of uh, the actual rates on the break-even rate. And we find within firm significant pass-through of the break-even rate only for safe borrowers. As you can see, uh, there is no significant uh, pass-through for risky borrowers. And this is actually consistent with the predictions of our theoretical model uh, that states that for risky borrowers, the interest rate is disconnected from the riskiness of the loan and depends on the ability of these borrowers to uh, pay. So, uh, as I mentioned, like in the beginning, the zombie literature infers subsidized loans based on some identification criterion. Uh, this creates a joint hypothesis problem. You test the, uh, the main research question along with the validity of the uh, criterion. Here, we directly observe the negative markups. And this is what I have like in the graph all the loans in our sample that are extended uh, with actual rates below the break-even rate. And I love to uh, show this like, graph in my class and ask my students, like, where do you think the zombies uh, live? And most of them say, like, in this area, this is the zombie land. So these guys, they were supposed to uh, borrow with 20 to 25%. Instead, they get, like, 5 to 10%. So let's see now what we would pick up on our sample if we applied uh, two very popular criteria that have been widely used in the zombie lending literature. So the first is to require the actual rate be, be, uh, be below uh, some prime rate. Uh, this is what we're getting, very few observations. So this criterion seems to be overly conservative and misses most of the cases and the most interesting cases, I would say. Uh, so we don't pick anything here, even though we have like significant uh, subsidies. <clears throat> Another popular criterion is an indicator of distress. The literature loves low interest coverage ratios. So here we have like all the loans extended to borrowers that had like ICR less than one for the past two years. And we get more cases. We get some very interesting cases, but also we get some loans that they're actually being upcharged. Uh, <clears throat> So the interest coverage ratio seems to be a noisy indicator uh, of subsidization since we have loans that are subsidized, but also loans uh, that are being upcharged. So we have like a type one error here. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I want to show you is that the introduction of the pricing model had the material effect. I think it's important because we have like a lot of policymakers here and regulators. So the model worked to an extent, and as you can see here, there's clear initial pass-through from break-even rates to actual rates. We have additional tests uh, in order to examine alternative interpretations of our results. I don't really have the time 
to go through them. And let me conclude by saying, like in this paper, we directly observe positive and negative markups in corporate loans using the difference between the actual rate and the break-even rate at the loan level. Our theoretical models predicts that during the crisis period, the risky firms will optimally avoid liquidation because of depressed collateral values and the fact that the bank recognizes the option value of keeping these firms alive until their productivity or the economy rebounds. And at the same time, the upcharging of safe firms is sustainable because there is limited access to capital that impairs bank competition. It becomes like very costly for competitors to step in and poach the upcharged loans. Uh, after the implementation of the break-even rate and the pricing model, we document cross-subsidization from safe to risky firms, pass through the declines with the severity of the crisis, or like cross-subsidization that becomes more pronounced during uh, more dramatic times, and asymmetric pass-through in the intensive margin. Thank you very much. And the discussion will be Diana Bonfim from Banco de Portugal and ECB. Yeah, so I actually compensate for Florian and I have a double disclaimer. These are my views, not those of the Bank of Portugal and the ECB. So, so, so this is, I, I think, uh, I mean, a, a great paper. It's, it's, I truly enjoyed it. I had seen it before. I, I had it on my reading list. It was really uh, good to go now in a much deeper way through the paper. And, and so the starting point of the paper is, I mean, we, we know that zombie lending, credit misallocation, these are, of course, very important problems. And, and I mean, pro these are problems for supervisors, for, for financial stability, and, and more broadly for the economy, if you care about economic growth and, and productivity of the economy. But as, as Nikos showed us very clearly, the, the challenge is really to spot it, right? So we know it's a big problem, we know it exists, but we seem to have difficulties in agreeing how exactly are we able to stop, to spot these firms that might be unviable, that might be under strong difficulties, but somehow they are kept alive by, by the banks. And so this is really an important mission for supervisors to understand where are these, these firms. And, and this paper has, in my opinion, a, a very important contribution because it's, it's sitting on a very unique piece of information, which is the ability to compare the interest rates that the banks are offering on the loans. That is not hard to get. Most of us here could have access to information like that. But I actually compare that to this break-even interest rate. Okay, And so this is something that was imposed, as Nikos explained to us, this was imposed during the bailout in Greece to somehow ask the banks to, 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 to be able to determine what would be this break-even interest rate that would somehow capture what would be the proper pricing of the bank loans based on the, the funding cost of the banks, based on the cost they face to give this loan, plus the risk of the borrower. And so the main conclusion of the paper is to show that during the Greek crisis, what we had was that the safe borrowers were actually paying uh, significant markups. And, and this was to some extent to cross-subsidize the riskier borrowers who were charged smaller or in many cases actually negative markups. Okay, so this is very strong and clearly supported evidence of cross-subsidization of bad credit during the crisis. So I, I have, I, I mean, the, the papers, I, I think, I mean, very well advanced, and, and, and I mean, I, I have three sets of comments at this stage. One is about to what extent offering these lower interest rates to firms is going to be enough to, to keep them alive. The second one about the role of collateral, and then I'll talk a little bit about what, what, what is behind the bank's behavior. So, so my first comment is, is, um, is really to, to, to challenging a little bit the idea of, of what is going on here. So the main result is that the banks offer riskier firms these interest rates that are below the break-even rate, okay? And we, sh we saw this plot, and we saw, saw that in some cases this can actually be quite large. In most cases, we're talking about a few, a, a few basis points or, or at most a few percentage points of difference. And so my question here is, to what extent is this difference enough to make unviable firms be able to remain alive? And here I think there's something important um, that, that, that we, we are not 
thinking about in this paper, which is the concept of zombie lending often involves indeed offering interest rates that are subsidized, offering interest rates that are lower than what they should be, but there's also the lending dimension. So it also requires that somehow there is a permanent rollover of the loans being granted to these ailing firms, and in many cases actually granting additional loans, and this is what can somehow make the firm remain alive. And so in, in the paper, I couldn't find, so I, we, we have a lot of unique results on the pricing dimension, but I wasn't able to find similar results on the lending dimension. I think this is an, a very important part of the story as well. And, and so to understand how different is the lending behavior of the bank towards weaker and safer firms, assuming that okay, their demand is the same, which is, of course, a tricky assumption, I think if at least tentatively exploring that, this, this would be very, very important. And, and, and moreover, I mean, of course, Okay, we have trade-off with the, the, the authors have these very interesting data set and setting with the break-even rates. We can do this for one bank. The trade-off is we cannot know what the other banks are doing. And in zombie lending, this is also an important dimension as, as there might be strategic behaviors when several banks are, are lending to the same firm. So then my, my second set of comments is about the rule of collateral. Okay, so, so the, the, this is really at the core of the paper. The, the main reason for the banks to engage in this cross-subsidization is that they might not want to terminate the loans to these, to these weak firms during the crisis because of the depressed collateral values. And so this is the core of the entire model. And so I entirely agree this is an important mechanism, but, but of course, I mean, it, it might be in reality a bit more complex than that, okay? So it might be that it's also more difficult to actually be, for, for the bank to be able to seize the collateral, especially in the crisis. And, and if the bank does seize the collateral, the ability to liquidate this during a period in which many other uh, collateral holders would be doing the same would also create a systemic dimension. And so, I mean, collateral has this very central role in the model, which, which I think makes a lot of sense. And so, um, in, in the post-crisis period, terminating these loans to the weak firms is actually profitable, okay? So it's only in the crisis that, that, that the depressed the, the collateral values somehow stop the banks from terminating the loan. So this is crucial in, in, in the workings of, of, of the model. But my, my reading is that in the empirical analysis, this is not explored in a comparable way, okay? Um, and so, I mean, there's data reported on, on the percentage of loans that have collateral, and this is a very high percentage, I think, if I recall, around 85%. But for instance, it would be very insightful to understand um, how much do banks actually recover, okay, for those loans that defaulted and for which the bank was able to seize the collateral, what were the recovery rates? Also, and perhaps even, even easy, more easy to address, would be to, to try to understand how are things working for loans with and without collateral. Okay, this would be a simple exercise to do. Also, not, not only looking into this uh, extensive margin dimension, but also looking actually into the percentage of the loan that is being collateralized. How, how big of an impact does this have into the bank's lending behavior and their willingness to cross-subsidize these loans? And, and, and another thing in terms of making the empirical analysis closer to the model is that it would be, I mean, the model has this crisis and post-crisis period, so I think it would be really important to think about the different stages of the crisis and how do the results change in these two periods. Uh, then my, my third comment is, is about, I mean, wh why, why do the banks subsidize these loans? Okay, the, the main explanation, we talked about this already, is that the banks want to, to avoid, at, at, at any cost apparently, the, the need to liquidate uh, these, these loans due to the depressed collateral values. I think there's a very important detail here that I think Nikos didn't cover in today's presentation, which is the fact that actually, as, as reported in, in the paper, I don't know which bank was this, but it's mentioned that this bank was actually a well-capitalized bank, and, and not only that, it actually received more capital during the crisis. And this I found very interesting as well, because, I mean, actually the zombie lending literature, at least since the paper by, by Maria Santagianetti and, and Simonov, tells us that zombie lending is something that is done mostly by the banks that have weaker capital ratios. So these are the banks that have stronger incentives to do so. So this does not seem to be the case. If this was one of the best capitalized banks in Greece, uh, I mean, they, they still do this. Of course, we don't know what the other banks are doing, right? So this might be just a very uh, 
the, the results might somehow underestimate whatever was going on in Greece in aggregate terms. But I wonder wh what would have happened if the bank didn't have as much capital as apparently it had. Then there's a, a very interesting feature in the paper that I think wasn't mentioned here either. Which is, so the, 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 the authorities ask the banks to compute these break-even rates, okay? And, and more interesting than that, the, the new framework actually asked the banks, well, if you deviate, if you're going to offer a rate that it's below the break-even rate, you have to tell us why, okay? And so I understand that, I mean, for given the, the, the disclosure agreement, the authors cannot explicitly explore that, and they do an attempt in the appendix of the paper by kind of aggregating the justifications. So I, I find this incredibly frustrating, but at the same time very important for supervisory purposes, because this is not something that the banks were hiding, okay, and like what we would think about what zombie lending would be. This is not something that is being done in a way that it's hidden from the supervisor. It's actually pretty much in front of them and they have to explain exactly why they are doing it. And so I think, I mean, in, in, the, in this respect, I think it would be really very important to, to understand more deeply how the break-even rate is being estimated, okay? So Nikos gave us a, a bit of an insight on that in the paper. There's a, a few references, but it's really very general. So for instance, we, it was not clear to me if this is estimated with a through the cycle perspective. And so this can have a certain type of implications when we think about cross subsidization, or if it's something that it should be regularly updated going forward. So this is of course captured when it was implemented, but how does it work over time? And relatedly, I mean, it's possible that for some firms and some industries, it's easier to price loans in an observable way. And so in this case, the, the break-even rates really capture the risks that the banks are incurring. But it might be that in other cases, it's much harder to do that. So to what extent might the markups, positive or negative, be, being, be capturing this, this uncertainty? Uh, and then in a final minute, I mean, just, just a couple of, of, of minor issues. So. Uh, I mean, the paper focuses on these very large borrowers, so in total 150 borrowers. Um, I understand that, that this is possibly due to, to limitations in accessing the data, but still I would be curious to learn more about how heterogeneous these firms are and actually how international are these firms, how many of them are multinationals and, and, and how many of, many of them have activities abroad. Um, and, and, and the final uh, point that I would like to raise is that um, it is mentioned that the observable firm level and loan level characteristics do not have a strong power in explaining the, the actual interest rate that the banks have, but I wonder how well do they perform in explaining the break-even rate, and this somehow relates to my previous point. So summing up, I think this is really a, a great paper. Uh, thinking about what is the takeaway for supervisors, I think that the important message here is that looking into loan pricing can really be very informative about risk taking of banks and about possible misallocation of credit. And so uh, I really encourage you to read and to think more deeply about what we learned from this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. So we have a few minutes to take questions from the floor or comments. Papa, please. Yeah. Now, the title of the paper, cross-subsidization, and the discussion about zombie lending all has this sort of negative connotation. But on the other hand, there is this uh, traditional literature that emphasizes the, the um, gosh, the, gosh, what's the name of that? The um, relationship lending. I mean, the fact that one of the advantages of bank finance vis-a-vis market finance is the fact that, well, the bank can accompany the firm during bad times and therefore sort of uh, make the firm uh, survive. And so the question is, would it be interesting, maybe you have uh, the possibility of uh, exploring uh, how these firms that receive this subsidized lending fare, say a few years after the event? Thank you. Over there, to the right, in here. I was struck by this idea that we could even, I mean, the break-even rate in some way could be interpreted as a marginal cost curve, right? And it, I'm struck by this idea, I mean, how is this marginal cost curve would even be stable 
if they actually price, I mean, the, if they have to actually priced according to the break-even rate, right? Because then in equilibrium, you might start attract, attracting the bad types, almost like in a Stiglitz and Weiss sort of model, and then sort of, and the market could actually break down entirely uh, if not for some sort of rationing, et cetera. So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on, on this on this issue of actually estimating these break-even rates and how feasible are that is that in a general equilibrium framework? Am I allowed to ask? Uh, sure, Florian. Um, I mean, everything hinges on the break-even rate. So is there any chance you can do some robustness to that? I mean, suppose, for example, simulate error around the break-even rate or just a tiny deviation from what you have, and if your results are robust to that, or do they hinge on getting it exactly right? Yeah, I'm just wondering whether the creditor that you call subsidized is really subsidized, because the alternative would be to liquidate these firms and increase uh, the loan uh, uh, enforcement mechanism is still be inefficient. So in that case, essentially, the bank has almost nothing. So, uh, so if the firm were to be liquidated, uh, the bank would get almost nothing because the loan enforcement uh, mechanism is very inefficient. So the alternative is to get nothing. So what you call subsidization may in fact be maximizing the present value for the bank. Okay. Do you want to take it from here, Nicolas? Yes, uh, I would like to thank Diana for the uh, discussion. She has uh, seen the paper multiple times. And uh, let me start uh, from the last comment. So uh, what we saw like in the model is like uh, two different channels, one that leads to upcharges, one that leads uh, um, to subsidies. So th the subsidies are motivated by the option value. That if I wait and I keep you alive and then uh, I exit the crisis, I will be able to liquidate you at a higher price. So it's uh, it's a very rational, uh, you know, uh, approach here. And we don't have the data after Greece exited the crisis, but we have some incidents of like large companies that they were getting severely subsidized during the crisis that were liquidated after. Uh, to also respond to the first question, like what happens after? What happens after? We don't have the data, we only have like two years of data, but we see like uh, stories that are consistent uh, with our non-crisis uh, period. Um, so the role of collateral here, uh, I agree it's central, and I think like uh, um, it also plays a role in uh, the, the example I showed you uh, with uh, the internet coverage ratio. So it explains why some uh, companies that are being distressed uh, and they don't have like cash flow, they're being charged. So we try to move like uh, beyond the collateral and emphasize the two channels of like the option value of recovery and how costly is to liquidate during a crisis. And this affects like bank competition. And for regulators and supervisors and policymakers, it's important to understand that if the economy is in crisis, these things should be expected. So if the, the safe companies, they don't have like uh, anywhere to go, uh, then they will be at charge. Uh, if uh, like collateral values are collapsed uh, or like uh, the, the crisis is like very prolonged and severe, we should expect uh, the, the ratio of zombie firms to increase. So we have seen uh, in many studies these patterns, these trends, increased uh, shares of like uh, zombies during a crisis. In many episodes, uh, we try to figure out like why this happened, why this makes sense. And yes, the relationship banking uh, can be like uh, one uh, cause of zombie lending. We find that, you know, with the implementation of this uh, pricing model, relationship banking reduced. Like in the in a, in a previous like draft, we, ha we focused also a little bit on the uh, pre-period and we found like, you know, if you have a politician on the board, you get like a better interest rate. These things are gone once the pricing model is uh, in place. However, uh, there are limits uh, to the, uh, the efficacy of the regulation. 
the regulation is like invariant, cannot capture the fact that in times of crisis, uh, there is option value to keep like weaker borrowers alive. Uh, and uh, also like the cost of liquidating uh, to finance or poach like uh, other projects uh, is uh, very high. Um, <clears throat> Diana, uh, for your comments, I just want to say like, uh, we're using the justifications, we just cannot state what uh, the justifications are. And actually, I think it's a very interesting result that we had to put in the appendix at the request of uh, reviewers. Um, <clears throat> we find that the justifications are related to the break-even rate, not the markup. And this means that the justifications are not related to the past history or uh, uh, like uh, the relationship banking, like uh, the past history of the, of the client. Uh, and the bank, a very important thing that we will make sure to make it clear is that the break-even rate is estimated every time uh, the company takes a loan. So even if it's a rollover, it's a new loan, so they estimate the break-even rate, and the break-even rate changes with customer and loan characteristics. Uh, we have some uh, uh, summer statistics for the large companies. I don't think we... we have looked at multinationals, but this is like very interesting. The fact that there is no strong effect of uh, um, um, loan and firm characteristics uh, shows, and we had like some uh, specifications in the previous drafts, uh, that the break-even rate actually can capture these effects. Uh, because like the break-even rate only, only has like exogenous uh, uh, risk assessment and inputs so they use like uh, uh, like uh, data from uh, uh, balance it, uh, balance it items and uh, credit ratings. Um, we cannot share more about the, the, the pricing model, uh, but we have the components, uh, we have the variables, and we have calculated the break-even rate and we verified that it's uh, correct. Uh, now it's interesting to see like if we can do some robust test to see like if these effects offer. But we have like we have calculated the break even rate ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, pretty straightforward. And I have one more comment about the general equilibrium that I want to discuss with you because uh, I, I, there might be like more to it. Uh, uh, I want to understand what, what you're thinking. Uh, thank you for all your questions, and yeah, thank you for an excellent uh, discussion. Thanks to you, to the presenter and the discussant.